Um, it, 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 so ho hopefully no one will, will, will be wanting for anything. Um, if you have questions, there's folks manning the information table outside the whole time. So if you need guidance on finding something, there's somebody there to help. So now we're actually going to kick off the program. Um, we get to start today with one of our, our two keynote speakers, and, and um, this, this should be, you know, this, we're really delighted to have her here. Um, Dr. Sam Hastings is a professor and the director of the School of Library and Information Science at the University of South Carolina. She has a rather distinguished record of leadership and service in our field, um, including a stint as president of ACIS, and of course, being a director of one of our programs. Her research centers on the changing roles of information professionals in society. Not surprisingly, a key part of this are the issues that we're talking about here. And she's going to begin our discussion today with a talk that's going to help us frame central questions to what we're going to be thinking about and discussing all day. So please welcome her, Sam Hastings. Thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be here. I think this is probably one of the most important topics that professionals can get in a room and discuss. And I also believe that if you want to solve a problem, in this case, lack of representation of underserved populations in our field, you get really smart people in a room and talk about it. So I'm glad you're all here because I'm not very smart. <laughs> I want to share, I, you know, you speak and you get a gift, right? This is the best, these are the best gifts I've ever received as a speaker. And I want to share them with you so you can appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into these. First, I have a pair of socks. <laughs> Beautiful Maryland socks with a terrapin and a little thing. I don't think I've ever been given socks. This is so bad. I'm just touched. It's like so sweet. And then a really good looking mascot, Beanie Bay. <laughs> now, the best part of this is they're both made in the United States of America. Now, where they found them, I'm going to find out. Because if you've tried to buy socks lately, they're not made in America. <laughs> so, thank you very much for the gifts. Brian, if you were in charge of this, you'd be rocked. That was an amazing, amazing accomplishment there. I'm going to change this up a little bit. I do have a PowerPoint, so um, if you stick with me, at the end, I will treat you with some pictures. You get to see images. Um, if you fall asleep, you're going to miss the images. <laughs> I'd like to keep this fairly informal. Um, the talk itself, I believe, will be in, in text in a um, LQ publication. Is that right, John? Okay. So I'm not, you know... Let's, let's keep this as informal as we can. You can read the, the real stuff later. So don't be afraid to interrupt me. Um, if I say something you think is controversial or that you agree with, let me know. Um, if you want to stop and discuss something, let's stop and discuss. OK. <clears throat> Having this hosted by the University of Maryland, I think, is really appropriate. Um, I'm very fond of this iSchool and of the faculty here, so it's almost like coming home. In 2010, the ALA Diversity Report, I'm going to start with stats, but I'm not going to kill you with them, um, lists a total of 118,666 credentialed librarians in 2010. 6,160 are African American. 3,000. 661 are Latino. That means about 8% of our workforce in libraries represent more than 40% of our population. In 1990, we had 120,365 librarians. Think about that, we had more librarians in 1990 than we do now. And um, 7,423 were African American and 2,266 were Latino. In 20 years, we have fewer librarians and a smaller percentage of librarians of color. And even worse, there's only 563 African American men in the whole mix. 
5% of the total in 2010. So what's wrong with this picture? How many of you have been in the public library lately? Who walks in the door? Do they all look like me? No, they don't. Well, thank God. <laughs> you know, it's like the people we serve are a very, very diverse population. And until our schools can start producing products, I call them graduates, <clears throat> not widgets, graduates, that can um, reflect the complexion of the people we serve, we're not going to be relevant. So, in this discussion, I'm not suggesting that diversity is about race, or only about race. Diversity is not about color, or gender, or age, or differently, different ability, language, or sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status. It's about all of these things. If we don't ensure that our libraries have those frontline professionals working with their communities that reflect the nature of those communities, then we'll lose those valuable patrons to the back fence. And what do I mean by the back fence? They're going to ask people that look like them for information they need to be successful. And when that happens, we have no control over the validity of the information. That has a, a horrible consequence in many, many ways. And it doesn't make a sustainable future for us. Nor does it help build a literate and knowledgeable citizenry, which I think is what we're all about when we come down to it. That's what we want to do. So encouraging diversity is one of the most important things we do as educational institutions. Education is really about intellectual diversity, if you think about it, um, looking at things differently. We don't want to all believe the same thing. And one of the principles of academic freedom is that we have the chance to do that, that I can think differently from you, and you will respect me and give me the privacy to do so. Now, if we, now, <clears throat> If we want to ensure our future, and I believe that we are in um, some dire times for that, um, and the future meaning library and information professionals combined, then our professionals have to mirror the people they serve by taking action now. I don't think we can wait much longer. And in some ways, I thought about when I got invited for this, and I love Megan and Paul dearly, but um, I thought, you know, here we go, let's talk about it some more. You know? Okay. Anyway, but I'm here, and I'm happy to be here, and I do think we need to keep talking about it. And the one thing I think is really important is that we never reach a goal. This is not about quotas or numbers. There is no magic little star that you're going to get when 40% of our information professionals are from underserved populations. That's not going to happen. Every single day, you have to protect the rights of people to be diverse. So, now, <clears throat> if you think about um, that we go backwards sometimes um, instead of forwards, it makes it an even more pressing challenge. So today, I want to start and talk about five ideas that I've been exploring. So stick with me. There's only five of them. That's the best my brain can hold. Um, <laughs> but um, I think maybe they will focus you in ways to think about action around the problem of representation. So first, let's explore the concept of going beyond mere equity of access. If we truly want to be inclusive, that means every format, every type of information, available anytime to anyone. Right? Yeah. Uh, let's see, what time does your line break close? <laughs> you know. <clears throat> if, we, if we truly want to be inclusive, the real issue is at the bottom of the iceberg. And that bottom of the iceberg is that diversity without inclusion means nothing. Every message we construct must say, you are welcome here. Regardless of your belief, regardless of your color, regardless of your 
intellectual proclivity, you are welcome here. So assortment, difference, distinctiveness, medley, unlikeness, variance, variety, variegation are all synonyms for diversity. Notice that not one of these terms includes concepts of quotas or force of any kind. Diversity is the natural state, if you think about it. I think that was Darwin's whole deal, wasn't it? Homogeneity, sameness, and similarity, and uniformity are all very unnatural in the natural state. Unnatural in the natural state. Boy, I got away with words, don't I? <laughs> um, we want to get to the point where diversity is not an issue, and our environments are all inclusive and welcoming and based on integrity and justice. And that can be integrity and justice to an individual or to a group of people. Now, we've got a draft plan. We finally got a diversity officer at the University of South Carolina, and he's fabulous. His name is John Dozer, and I'm a big fan. And he's been working on a draft plan. Our school was the first unit on campus six years ago to have a diversity plan. It's up on the web, and you're welcome to go take a look at it. We're in the process of, of updating it and rewriting it right now with our diversity leadership group. But the university strategic tactical plan says and defines inclusion this way. Inclusion refers to the active, intentional, and ongoing engagement with diversity in ways that increase one's awareness, content knowledge, cognitive sophistication, and empathetic understanding of the complex ways individuals interact with systems and institutions. And you're welcome to borrow that anytime you want. <laughs> Inclusion is the act of creating environments in which any individual or group can feel welcomed, respected, supported, and valued. Now, part of our um, strategy at the University of South Carolina has been to recruit heavily from diverse populations. And my role has been to make sure that we keep them and that they're happy. And they're part of everything we do. Because I think that really is the challenge, if you think about it. The inclusion part is much more important than the process of bringing differently represented groups together. Got, I'm getting this feeling that we got to keep them, keep them happy, make them part of, the, part of the play. So, second, the methods we use to measure access for, it's my second thought, that was the first one. We're on to number two now. The methods we use to measure access for and service to specific populations are not adequate. We can't even tell the story of what we do right. You know, we wouldn't be having this symposium again another year if we could tell the story and, and get the data to say to tell the story of what we do right. We need new tools. We need new tools to tell the story of inclusion, not just diversity. For example, we don't even know what the costs for inaccurate information are or how lack of access may harm our social structures. And if we keep turning people away, or don't welcome people in, then that's going to become a larger problem than any of us, I think, are ready to deal with. So I think this may be the most difficult challenge we face. And believe me, I'm really not sure how to solve it. I think we need some good methodologists, and I'm sure there are some in this audience, um, to start talking about what tools we use and standardizing them so that across institutions we can compare data. Huh? Ooh, scary, huh? <laughs> okay, number three. We need a rationale for change, and sometimes it's difficult to affect change. Remember that academics are not designed to turn on a dime. We've worn the same outfits for 300 years. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know how many of you do committee work, but it's like, I'm convinced that the reason we have committees is to slow everything down. <laughs> and don't make decisions rapidly, because you may be wrong. Right? So we're not prepared to change very quickly, and yet 
what's required of us to become leaders of diversity and inclusion is to change pretty fast, and we've got to do it. We can't be standing around here. Anyway, so um, as an essential part of what we do as library and information professionals, we, we connect people. We connect people to the information they need. That's never changed, has it? Isn't that the same thing we've been doing for 300 years or longer? So it's difficult to train if you think about providing skill sets for graduates to go out into the field with for such a huge range of need. It's a, 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 just this landscape of very different things, which is good. But we need to meet the challenge. We need to figure out how we're going to do this. We need to affect the change, and we need to do it in our curricula and in our attitudes and in the way we believe the, or how we believe the importance of inclusion. So we've got to be flexible, and we've got to get ready to adopt new practices. I don't know why we're so recalcitrant. Somebody says new and everybody runs. You know, it's like, wait, wait, come back, come back. I didn't mean new. I mean different. <laughs> and I think part of it is we've been so beat up um, from the recession, from um, the tension of keeping our, our um, services active and open and available, that at times I feel that we've kind of terrified. <laughs> and close down to protect. And when we get into that protective mode, we're not able to do different. You know, we're able to only do the same because we can't see, for one thing. So that idea of flexibility and adopting new practices, I don't even think it matters what the new practices are. Um, I think they can all be different for any individual um, institution or um, group. All right, we're ready for number four. You guys aren't interrupting me. Is this good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> we have to grow our own future. Best solution I know is to recruit the best and the brightest. We just hired two new faculty at the University of South Carolina. And I'm over the top with it. I'm just, you know, these are just sparkling, smart, you know, punk, irreverent. <laughs> and you know what? They're going to be impossible to manage. <laughs> All right, we'll deal with it. So um, the best solution, as I say, is to get those best and brightest and add sensitivity to diversity over a deep understanding of user needs. What do I mean by that? Sounds good, doesn't it? That everything that we do to understand how people seek, use, and um, disseminate information is very, very important. However, I think what we really need to do is look at how differently able or otherly able people do the same thing. What do their user needs look like? Is it can we put them in the same pot? I'm not sure. Um, you know, growing our own future means that we need to recruit diverse faculty, staff, and students. And then the real trick is to provide that environment where they feel included, they feel part of the machine. They can thrive and survive once they feel that there's no, no threat to their livelihood. And that means we need scholarships and support for faculty research. And it may be support for faculty research that may not be attractive to, to federal funders. A lot of times people don't really want to talk about how bad it is. So getting those tool sets where we can do comparative data analysis, getting a way to recruit and keep a diverse client, diverse faculty, staff, and um, student body I think is uh, really important. We've been real lucky um, in South Carolina with our scholarships and funding for um, recruiting diverse students, our students from diverse backgrounds. So I, I feel pretty good. We've got um, two state associations, one for school librarians and one for um, regular librarians. Um, school librarians especially, you know. They're the front line. 
<laughs> and uh, so both of those associations have um, provided funding for us and, and important funding. In addition, we have uh, Charles Bolden's mother was a librarian in Columbia, Ethel Bolden. And Charles and his family, do you know Charles Bolden, the astronaut? Yeah. Started a <laughs> foundation. So I have foundation money for the Ethel Bolden Scholarship, which is a lovely one. So we do, you know, and there's other sources of, of scholarship. <laughs> but I can't emphasize how important it is to take the financial stress off of students as often as we can. And take the intellectual stress off faculty and help them with their um, research. We've done some pretty creative things in collaboration with other units on campus and also um, with foundation money. So it's been real, real interesting to see the faculty tackle things. One of the things I'm most proud of right now um, is Kendra Albright and Karen Gavigan, two of our faculty members, have produced a graphic novel called um, AIDS in the End Zone. And just briefly, let me tell you the story. So Kendra had done work in um, Africa looking at how a message and the format of a message can prevent the spread of AIDS, and especially in Uganda where they actually stem the um, horrible um, epidemic. I think you can call it an epidemic. Um, so she came, and now on our faculty, she and Karen got together, and Karen's expertise is in graphic novels. And so they were going to, you know, hey, great idea. We'll, we'll get the message of AIDS prevention into this format that will be attractive to young people. And we'll, we'll get that match, right? Well, then they went, you know, two white women writing about it. <laughs> it's no more good. So they went to the juvenile detention center. This was really fun getting the IRB for this institutional <laughs> review board. And recruited like 10 or 12 African American males, and they wrote the novel. And then she got a really good graphic artist that illustrated the novel. And we've got some great footage. There's some on the web um, of, you can't see the faces of the young men, but they're so proud. And now they're testing it in the field to see if this is really a format and a message that's going to get through to adolescent males in South Carolina. So there's, there's a good example. The funding for that came from the provost. You know, remember, I think most of you know me well enough I can tell you this. So the provost says to me, how are you doing, Sam? I said, I'm OK. I said, my knees are hurting. Man, they're hurting really bad. It's like, God, just, you know, every day. He goes, well, why, why do your knees hurt? And I said, because they're all scabbed up from begging. <laughs> don't, don't send this tape to my provost. <laughs> so we got some provost money, and we got some foundation money, and we got some um, community um, United Way support money. So I think things like that, you have to be creative. I think the days of a federal mom coming in, handing you a research um, support system on a platter, um, even if you have a well-developed agenda, it's not there. So it's, it's, um, it's challenging. So being creative in the way you cobble together these things. So in this idea that we're growing our own future, um, I think our role as teachers, we need to insist, and we do have a role as teachers, you know, when I talk about inclusion, one of the things that I can't get out of my brain is one of my early, well, one of my first professional jobs, I was a high school math teacher in a little um, farming community called Flowing Wells. And um, I was so excited. I was just, I mean, these kids are going to love math, right? <laughs> I'm in. I'm just, oh boy, because I've always loved math. So, you know, naturally, and I'm a good teacher, just green as can be, just Jeez. So I get in there, and um, I'm the first woman in the math and sciences in this little community. And um, the very first day, I get the lunch break, and I walk into the faculty lounge, and all these men just sit there and go like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I went home crying. But I went back the next day, and uh, I loved that job. 
Every once in a while I think, you know, when I have a really bad administrative day, I think, I'm gonna, that's it. I'm going back, I'm teaching high school. <laughs> and that tells you how bad the day was. <laughs> so we've got this role as teachers. No matter what, we have a role as teachers. And we need to insist that information literacy for everyone, everyone, is a core requirement, a requirement that we cannot negotiate on. If we don't help people be able to find the information they need, evaluate it, and use it, we're failures. We can just hang it up. We might as well just quit wasting everybody's time and go home. Mm. <laughs> so <clears throat> what I have been pushing lately is that it's all types of literacy. It's not just the ability to read. It's the ability to get a bank account, to get an insurance policy, to figure out what, how to read a label on food and make choices about nutrition and health. So what we've been doing in that effect is we've um, got our little outreach program, which is turning into a pretty big one, with our mascot, Cocky, Cocky Screen Express. Um, over the last six years, we've been going to every county and every time in one school, now we're on repeat visits for about half of the Title I schools. We're going back for the third time, been collecting data. We give out a book, and then we have an evening presentation where we separate out the kids and the parents, the families, and they will come if you have free food. So I got the Bilo Supermarkets to give us some food, and um, we have a, a, a session, an information session for the parents on a variety of things. So, so far we've done health, nutrition, financial, actually got bankers to come in and talk to people. Um, a lot of people don't know what an adjustable rate mortgage is, you know? Um, and of course, bankers are happy to tell you. <laughs> That's one of their favorite mortgages. Anyway, and, and we got some funding from some of the banks um, to help us do this. So that treatment and that reaching out to the community, deep into the community, including the families, I think has been um, phenomenally successful. The finding quality books around these subject areas for K through four, and sometimes you know, they bring their siblings, so we always have something for the young adults if, if they happen to come. So that's difficult. I think we need um, better content around specific sub subject areas. There's some good financial stuff that it's more math oriented than it is about the larger scope of opening a savings account and what does savings do for you and all that stuff. When the Students go out, the volunteers that go out with Kaki to do this programming, it changes their lives. It's not just the students that get to be read to, that get a book. For some of them, it's the only book they have in their home. Um, I've been doing some narrative and um, kind of oral history kind of collection of stories from the project. And uh, there's this one little boy, oh, I recognized him from the first time I saw him. And he's, he's gnarly, he's got sleep in his eyes and his face is dirty and his clothes are tattered and he's got this nasty old backpack. And uh, that's one of the questions I ask him is, do you still have the book that Cocky gave you on the last visit? And um, have you been reading it and all this stuff? He goes, oh yeah, yeah. Pulls it out of his backpack and it's all tattered up and I said, you carry the book with you? And he goes, it's not safe at all. <laughs> so, everything that we do, everything that we do, has to have a role of literacy included in it. We're not gonna survive if we can't read and navigate the complexities of this world. So, Understanding the societal value of diverse populations is something I'm not sure we've got a handle on. When I said at the beginning that, you know, diversity is the natural state, I, I'm not sure that we understand what happens if we lose diverse populations to gentrification or urban renewal or, you know, 
or we put them in urban ghettos. We, we have no idea what we lose as a society when we don't have those different opinions and different cultures included in our lives. <clears throat> so, one of the things that I've been thinking is that if we really want to look at cultural heritage as this inclusive, huge umbrella that we all live in, it's not something separate from us, it's us, right? Then we need to um, provide internships and service learning opportunities in a variety of environments so that students also understand that this is not a separate issue, this is part of what we are. And that gets to be difficult because internships require supervision. Internships, now I think there might even be a federal case coming up that unpaid internships are, you know, the scourge of academia and, you know, yay, an unfair advantage for businesses or something. It's like, really? Just let the kids get in there and do something. So, but that's okay. I'm not political. <laughs> So these internships and service learning opportunities, like I said, the volunteers that go out with CompuSearing Reading Express, Express, we've been studying what they, what happens to them too, it changes their lives. It, it makes them feel like they're doing something of worth. That, as Steve Jobs says, they're putting a ding in the universe, you know? There's something happening that they feel proud of. And they, they they're religious, they come every Friday, they get on the bus every Friday, and they go out into Bamberg and Allendale and Salkahatchee and every little town in between. That's fun. All right, <clears throat> so, you can't underestimate the value of being immersed in a community and providing needing, needed services that match the population served. You can't beat that. That's about one of the best feelings in the whole world. So, as we grow our future, we need to cultivate future information science and, and library faculty with research agendas, oh, research word again, that deal with issues around inclusion and the value of LIS professionals. We have to do this. I don't know who's doing research in that area other than Paul and Mega. Are you? Introduce yourself. Tell us what you're doing. Okay. Um, I'm Nicole Cook at the University of Illinois. I work at the library school there. So um, right now what I'm doing, a lot of what Sam is describing in terms of trying to figure out how to recruit more students. Um, also the, the whole retention issue. Um, and also I do a lot of work with trying to figure out how to recruit doctoral students yeah. of color. Um, Good. There aren't enough of us. Yeah, good. Good, Nicole. Anybody else doing something? Yes, let's hear what's going on at Wayne State. Uh, my name is Kathy Kamasi, and I'm assistant professor at Wayne State, and I've tried to uh, push beyond the sort of conceptual uh, conversations about diversity. We know the benefits of diversity. We know uh, the statistics about it, but um, what I, the angle I've tried to take is to look at the curriculum, and I know I was building on the work of, of with Paul and, and Renee Franklin and, and John, uh, what, where in the curriculum, in the library curriculum, do social justice and social competence concepts, can they be meaningfully integrated? So we talk about it, but you know, in the reference classes, in the intro classes, where, where's, um, where's the areas where we can talk about that? So that's where I've tried to, to kind of channel my energies, because I think uh, we have a lot of data about you know, the benefits of diversity, but we don't have a lot of rich empirical data about how to transform the curriculum uh, because a lot of it happens with the ideas and not just uh, physical bodies, but we need to transform the ideas around the concepts that we study. So everything from reference to technology to, to everything. So I'm trying to move uh, the curriculum towards a more multicultural kind of uh, great framework. Well, I want to come take your class. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think our 10 o'clock panel is here. Is that what happened? We got yes. our panel? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So um, I'm going to. I've kind of been lollygagging around here. <coughs> but let's get serious now. So I said five things. My fifth thing is that we need to develop a common research agenda that provides longitudinal and impact data. And so as you're doing that coffee and as you're doing your work, Nicole, we need to be able to communicate those across um, institutions. 
And I <clears throat> suggest this is a research agenda that I've been trying to solve for a long time. Um, I call it the ABC Inclusive Research Agenda, where A includes research on access, attitudes, attention, and attraction to funders. I know, just a four. <laughs> B focuses on best practices for recruitment, retention, and measuring impact. And C concentrates on collections, communities, and captioning. I believe that if we use these ABCs to guide us, we'll be able to have a research agenda that shares across institutions. So I promised you some pictures. Um, I absolutely am delighted that I got to talk with you today. Um, I believe that if we do this right, we have a bright and beautiful future, and uh, I hope you'll agree. So here we are. Um, when I started at South Carolina eight years ago, we had one person of a, from an underserved population, one out of a staff and faculty of 40. Now our staff and faculty are a little bit um, more than that. 58% of our doctoral students are from underrepresented minorities. 34% of our faculty and staff, and I believe 22% of our master's students. So. Reflect who you serve, that's number one. You, gotta, you have to look like the people you want to serve. You need to plan it. You gotta plan it, you gotta plan it, you gotta plan it, then you gotta plan it some more. Luckily, we're, we have a diversity leadership group Highly recommend that you form one immediately that have been working with us for years and they're just absolutely wonderful. Um, you gotta do it. You've gotta be out in the field. You've gotta be there um, interacting with the people that you serve. And recruiting, I was recruiting in that um, picture. <laughs> um, you gotta do it. There's our beautiful bus, the BP Oil America. It's, I'll take money from anybody. <laughs> Bought us, right? There's Cocky in the background. We're off on a um, Cocky's Reading Express. There's Tommy Preston in the front who started this with me. Um, you gotta evaluate it. You have to keep evaluating. You can't just say, we're done. You gotta prove it. You gotta say, this is how we did it, and this is why it's good, and this is what you can do too. You gotta live it. You have to be there. You have to go all the time, play, play, play. You've got to provide opportunities for cultural events. Um, one of the lovely things yesterday morning, 1,500 K through six students, 1,500 from all over South Carolina, marched on the state capitol for reading day. And they carried signs that said, kids who read succeed. It was fabulous. But the coolest part was that they had international representation, and they read um, Dr. Seuss's Cat in the Hat, started it out in English, then went to Spanish, and then German, then Arabic, ended up in French, and it was like, it was great. It was, the kids loved it. It was so much fun. So you gotta be out there. Scholarships and fellowships, as I said, the most important part of what we do. I know I'm running one minute over now, but I'm almost done. Gotta keep programming and doing different things. Community service is so important. If we're not out in the community serving them, how do we know what they want or need? And there's our diversity leadership group, fabulous people. You need to provide for differently abled in whatever format that is. That's Clayton Copeland, whose dissertation on equity of access I highly recommend to you. And include local celebrities in everything you do. They get the message out better than we can, and they will tell the story over and over. Include the student body, recruit everywhere you go, by the way, and um, present at state and national events. Keep telling the story, keep telling the story, keep telling the story, keep telling the story. And if you need anything from me, this is my contact information. Um, I will be presenting one of our doctoral students' posters tonight because I'm so lucky. <laughs> But I'll be here all day, and I sure do appreciate your time and attention.
Yeah. Yes. Does anybody have any questions? OCLC research money um, to also make sure that we disseminate it. Yeah. So. But what I mean is that there's a concept that there's a concept now of libraries as publishers. Yeah. Um, and so public libraries or whatever where they're actually mm -hmm. publishing books yeah. for the community to right. use. Right. right. So in part of it can be print on demand. But I forgot to tell you that the other thing that we started is the young Palmetto Palmetto Reader's Imprint, which is part of our, of our university press. How many of you have a, a young adult part of your university press? <laughs> and royalties <laughs> come back <laughs> to the Center um, for Children's Books and Literacy, which is our kind of outreach umbrella. So, um, and that that young Palmetto Press published the end zone. Okay. So it is available. The graphic novel. Now. Remember where I'm from, South Carolina. Do you think that South Carolina is going to just love it when I show up with a box full of AIDS in the end zone? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Dr. Sam, kind of on that note, would you talk about a little bit about the situation when a public library could be at odds with their community, mm -hmm. such as in California when um, a public library had to enforce an ordinance passed by local government to not allow sleeping or body odor in the library. Let, let's talk about good stuff today. But so, you know, if we start focusing on all the things we do wrong, we're never going to get anywhere. You know, and yeah, that was wrong. We're doing some wrong stuff in South Carolina right now. If you want, I can take a whole day and tell you everything wrong we're doing there. Fine. Let's do positive. Let's be positive. Let's move forward. Let's figure out ways to make this change work and stay instead. <coughs> I was thinking about ways that libraries could be leaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the publishing piece is a perfect way to do that, too. Yeah. OK, I'm getting All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.